War brings out the worst in humans. The barbaric nature of war pushes men to be capable of barbarism without pause or moral qualms. It doesn't matter which side or how just a nation's reasons are for participating in war. No nation is immune and all have committed horrible atrocities. These have been against civilians, women, children, the elderly, the sick, and of course the enemy. Often enemy prisoners of war are executed after their surrender. This is against the Geneva Convention and a war crime, but that doesn't matter. It still happens frequently for a variety of reasons. Sometimes militaries try to justify it with reasons such as not having the means to take prisoners. Other times it is out of revenge, sheer hatred, or just plain indifference towards human life brought about by the emotional and moral numbing caused by war. But some soldiers refuse to let their humanity slip regardless of the situation and their moral compass remains intact and they will not stand for immoral behavior regardless of the circumstances. This was the case with a German Tiger commander in spring of 1945 when he stopped the execution of five American POWs. And soon thereafter, as fate would have it, those he saved would be in a position to return the favor. But would they? The following story is a summary of events from the book Spearhead, written by Adam Makos. It was the morning of March 26, 1945. A spring rain fell as an armored column led by an M26 Pershing sped through a misty forest traveling deeper into Germany. Infantry wearing ponchos rode atop all the tanks in the column. As the tanks traveled on the road through the forest, the road began to curve when the column came upon a log roadblock blocking its path. The column stopped. The tankers and some of the infantry riding the tanks dismounted and approached the roadblock to examine it. While the Americans were occupied with the roadblock, the Germans were watching them. Sitting parked high atop a rocky rise were German anti-aircraft trucks. Each truck had a Flak 38 cannon mounted in its bed. The gun crews had the Americans in their sights. The Flak 38 had 20mm high explosive shells which would be ineffective against the Pershing and the Shermans but would be highly effective on the soft targets, the dismounted tankers and infantry. The infantry covered the stop tanks. They were stationary targets. This was an irresistible opportunity to the Germans watching them and the gunners stopped on the pedal of their cannons opening fire on the Americans. 20mm HE shells began raining under their position. Man and machine alike were being hit. The impacts on the tanks were negligible, but this wasn't the case with the soldiers. The exposed infantry and tankers were getting shredded by shrapnel. The driver of the third tank in the column floored it, and the Sherman sped out of the area with troops clinging to the engine deck. The tank swerved around the Sherman and Pershing in front of it, slid off the road, and slammed into a tree. Most of the troops riding the tank were thrown clear, except for one man whose ankle was crushed when it was pinned between the tank and the tree. The tank reversed and sped off, freeing the man whose ankle was crushed, leaving him and four other tank riders stranded in a ditch far ahead of the column. The tank column retreated, leaving the five soldiers isolated. The German fire stopped, and some of the Germans began moving down off the rise to mop up any resistance left behind. The five soldiers didn't stand a chance, especially with one of them having a crushed ankle. Options were extremely limited. Fight and die, or surrender. They chose to surrender, feeling that was the only sane option. Some of the soldiers had war souvenirs such as watches taken from dead Germans and SS insignia taken from a POW pinned to a pistol holster. They hurriedly tried to hide these items because if they were caught with them, they would surely be killed or severely beaten in the best of circumstances. Several Germans approached the GIs while their comrades covered them from atop the rise. The GIs were waving something white, either a handkerchief or a white shirt indicating their intention to surrender. Then the worst thing that could have happened in this situation happened. Machine guns from the American tank column barked to life. Machine gun bullets zipped towards both the five GIs and the Germans approaching them. The Germans scattered and the GIs dove for cover into the ditch. None of the GIs were hit, but some of the Germans were with bullets ripping into their bodies. The GIs began to furiously wave their flag of surrender and the firing stopped. But to their dismay, several Germans lay dead on the road. Though it wasn't their intention, the signs pointed to a false surrender. It looked as though the U.S. soldiers had lured the Germans out in the open on the pretense of surrender only for the Germans to be ambushed by a machine gunner. This is how it understandably looked to the Germans and the GIs knew it. The surviving Germans captured the five GIs and marched them off. They were enraged and kept jabbing the GIs with their rifles before coming to a stop at a farmhouse. There the Germans threw shovels at the GIs and told them to dig. This could only mean one thing. It was time for revenge. The GIs did as instructed and began digging their own graves. Gunfire and explosions echoed in the distance and German troops were racing past the farmhouse. The American tank column was pushing forward again. They were running out of time. 
As the GIs kept digging, a loud throaty roar grabbed everyone's attention. A camouflaged German tank was passing the farmhouse when the tank commander looked at the situation about to happen and spoke into his throat mic. The tank abruptly stopped. Everyone froze, GIs with shovels midair and stared at the tank. The tank commander climbed down from the tank and stormed towards the guards and the prisoners. His face was full of rage. He grabbed a fistful of the nearest guard and began screaming at him. None of the GIs understood German, but what was being said was pretty obvious to them. Something along the lines of, Yes, but did they shoot your men? After the tank commander gave the German guards an earful, the GIs were instructed to put their shovels down. The guards corralled them into the farmhouse while the tank commander observed them with arms folded and a look of disappointment displayed across his face. The tank commander then mounted his tank and it departed. The German guards left by truck and the GIs were left behind in the farmhouse still alive. It wasn't long before the GIs heard vehicles pull up outside the farmhouse. The engines sounded familiar but they didn't want to get their hopes up. They didn't dare move. The door was kicked in and a soldier wearing a third AD patch on his uniform walked in weapon in hand. The five GIs had been saved. Several days later in April, a soldier named Malcolm Buck Marsh was walking through the war-wrecked city of Paderborn, Germany when he came upon a huge armored giant blocking the road. It was quiet and it wasn't moving. It was a massive Tiger I and it appeared to have been knocked out for reasons unknown. Buck saw a soldier he recognized named Byron Mitchell and he called him over. Together with some rookie soldiers, they went to investigate the dead tiger. When they got closer to the tank, they saw it was camouflaged and its barrel had been cut short, making it inoperable. This looked like something the crew would have done so their tank couldn't be captured and used against them. As this group of soldiers was examining the tiger, a commotion to the left of the tank caught their attention. The soldiers saw a U.S. tank crew being rough with the German tank crew, most likely the crew of the tiger. One of the tankers grabbed the Tiger commander and threw him to the ground, repeatedly kicking him. The German crew could do nothing but watch their commander get kicked over and over again. Not knowing how much worse things were going to get, but having a good idea, Buck told the rookie soldiers they might want to look away. The U.S. tank crew encouraged the continued beating of the German tanker. Buck and Byron moved closer and were expecting to see SS insignia on the tank commander. The SS were particularly ruthless and as a result they often experienced no mercy at the hands of their captors if they surrendered and they were frequently executed. But there were no SS rooms, only a silver panzer skull. The man wasn't SS, he was just a Wehrmacht tanker. Buck gave Byron a look, his expression asking if it was worth interceding. They had seen enough violence, but they were also numb to it. Byron only shrugged in response. A lot of U.S. tanks and tankers were lost taking the rail yard that morning in Paderborn. They were angry and they wanted revenge. The U.S. tanker dishing out the beating drew his 1911. Everyone backed up and gave him space. He turned red with rage as the pistol was shaking in his hand. Buck didn't want to see what was about to happen and spoke up. You don't have to do this. The tanker's crew agreed with Buck. This wasn't combat anymore, it was murder. The German was on his knees. He removed his peak cap and begged for mercy. Byron got a better look at his face. He'd seen this man before. His face was burned into his memory. Byron began shaking his head saying, no, no, no. The U.S. tanker then chambered around, but before he could shoot the German, Byron jumped in between both men. Don't shoot him, Byron pleaded with the enraged tanker. What the hell, boy? You some kind of kraut lover? Was the tanker's response. Byron said, this fellow saved my life, and if you get that damn gun out of my face, I'll tell you about it. Byron then explained how several days earlier he and four other soldiers had been captured and were being forced to dig their own graves when a German tank commander was driving by, saw what was happening, stopped, and prevented their execution. This man was that tank commander, Byron explained. Buck was standing there listening to Byron tell the story and he couldn't believe what he was hearing but he stepped next to Byron and told the US tanker that Byron was telling the truth because he had heard the same story from other soldiers. The tanker eyed Byron and Buck and asked, are you sure this is the same kraut? Byron responded with the question, How could I forget the face of a man who saved my life? The tanker lowered his pistol and told Byron to get the German out of his sight before he changed his mind. Byron obliged and the U.S. tankers left. Buck and Byron stayed with the German prisoners until proper authorities came along and claimed them. Before he left, the German tanker put a hand on Byron's shoulder and in English said, Thank you. An author's note in the book Spearhead says they tried to find the identity of the German tank commander that day, and with the help of a colonel in the present-day German tank forces, they were able to determine a staff sergeant, Ubo Fibber Bloving, commanded the Tiger that was knocked out in the rail yard. But it's not been conclusively determined if that tank crew was from the knocked out Tiger or a different tank.
It's a pretty amazing story nonetheless, and if you haven't read Spearhead yet, I can't recommend that book enough. It's one of the best nonfiction books I've ever read in regards to World War II.